Who is Josh Peck's dad? This is a question I never thought I'd be asking myself, but let's examine it. So something I never knew about Josh Peck is that he's never publicly identified who his father is. Now, you may think that that's pretty normal, but in the world of Hollywood, I would say that it's highly irregular. Considering a lot of people in Hollywood are Nepo babies, or they have extensive Wikipedia pages written about them exposing their entire family trees, I think it's pretty wild that Josh Peck has managed to keep who his father is a complete secret. A secret that he started keeping from his early days starring on The Amanda Show. So I'm going to read you a little bit from Wikipedia. It says, Josh Peck was born in New York City. He grew up with his mother, Barbara Peck, who was a career coach and his maternal grandmother. Josh has never publicly identified his father, who was a married co-worker of his mother, and Peck's birth was the result of an extramarital affair. Josh Peck never met his father, who died in 2013. Now, I'm not trying to pry into Josh Peck's family privacy. It's totally valid if he wants to keep that a complete secret. But I do think it's interesting because in Hollywood, we usually know people's entire family trees and lineages, but not with Josh Peck. Jurors on this case were so haunted by the crime that they needed trauma therapy. In March 2018, 38-year-old Veronica Youngblood from Virginia was arrested. On the night in question, she had given her daughters gummies laced with a sleeping aid. Her daughters were 5-year-old Brooklyn and 15-year-old Sharon. The mother of two then shot both of her daughters. Horrifically, Sharon did not instantly die. She was actually able to ring police and explain to them that her mum had shot them both. When jurors on the case were played this 911 call, they were so distressed that they actually needed therapy. The teenager was taken to hospital where she sadly passed away. It transpired that Veronica had called her ex-husband after the killings and told him that she hated him. She also told him what she'd done. It's believed that her motive for this hideous crime was revenge over him. He'd actually been planning to move away to Missouri with Brooklyn the following weekend. Following her trial, Veronica was sentenced to 78 years in prison. This former Family Feud contestant has just been charged with murdering his estranged wife. But listen to what he had to say about her when he was on the show in 2020. What's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding? Honey, I love you, but said I do. Oh! <laughs> on February 23rd of this year, 41-year-old Rebecca Bleifnick was found dead inside of her Quincy, Illinois home by family members after failing to pick her kids up from school. She had been shot multiple times. Rebecca was a nurse and a mom of three who, at the time, was going through a divorce with her estranged husband, Timothy. They had been separated for two years, and at the time of the murder, they only lived about a mile apart. Timothy was arrested on March 13th, not long after authorities searched his home and a lagoon on a property that he co-owned. Although he maintains his innocence, some court documents that have since been publicly removed show that Rebecca had actually filed a protection order against Timothy and his father before her murder. He's being held at the Adams County Jail, and his attorney has argued that Timothy was only arrested because of the tremendous pressure from the community. She went on to say that the estranged husband is always the number one suspect, and that he doesn't have a criminal history, and that there was no domestic violence in the home. She's also saying that he's very active in his church, as if that means anything. Timothy is a former college football star who majored in criminal justice at Quincy University. Timothy was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and home invasion, and is due back in court tomorrow where he plans to plead not guilty. If convicted, he could face life in prison. This YouTube chef is accused of killing his lover. Daniel Sancho Broncalo is a 29-year-old celebrity cook and the son of two Spanish film stars. 44-year-old Colombian plastic surgeon Edwin Artiga had apparently been dating Daniel. However, it's thought that when Daniel tried to break up the relationship, things took a dark turn. Daniel claims that Edwin threatened to release intimate photos of him in retaliation. Daniel states that Edwin was so obsessed with him that it ruined his relationship with his girlfriend. It's alleged that Daniel was really worried with the impact that leaked photos would have on his family's reputation. He was allegedly so worried that he would go on to kill Edwin. Now, the pair were actually in Thailand at the time and were at a full moon party when Edwin was brutally killed. Edwin's body parts, including hips and thighs, were found by locals in plastic bags at a landfill site. Authorities claim that Daniel has admitted to the killing and dismembering. Daniel has denied that the murder was premeditated, but Thai authorities state that it was. CCTV images allegedly show Daniel buying a knife, cleaning products and gloves prior to the murder. 
He currently faces the death penalty if found guilty. This is Christopher Westbrook, a TikTok famous chef that was always making recipes and dinner for the sorority house he worked at. Now, people online really seemed to like Christopher. He seemed like this fun-loving chef who cared a lot about the food he was making for these young women. But nobody would have ever seen what was coming next. In August of this year, Christopher was arrested for the possession of CP, meaning he's a hardcore pedophile. And in total, he was charged with possessing, distributing, and viewing CP materials. But this story only gets more and more disturbing. So once authorities got a search warrant for Christopher's belongings, they entered his house and they recovered a laptop and a hard drive. And what they found on that hard drive was nothing short of absolutely disturbing. They found over 700 images of children being abused. Yes, more than 700 images of CP were found on his devices. That is a lot. And to think that before this arrest, he actually had 150,000 followers here on this platform. That's a really big amount of followers, and he could have turned this into some sort of a career. That is, if he didn't make such a terrible, terrible, disgusting, deplorable decision. This all started in June of 2021 when the Center for Missing and Exploited Children alerted local authorities saying that there were some explicit images involving children being uploaded to an account on Google owned by this guy. And thankfully authorities were able to sweep in, take this guy into custody and get him off the streets. Now, a lot of people were actually really pissed at Christopher because just a week or so before he was arrested, he got on TikTok and was begging people for money. This isn't a video that I want to make, I promise. But um, as most of you know, I work at a college. So yeah, he was asking people for donations. I know a number of people donated a quite a significant amount of money to this guy. And I don't know if the process has been started to get people refunds or what's going on with that. But I mean, I can't imagine the feeling of those people who donated thinking they were helping this lovable guy out when in reality they were donating to a hardcore, disturbed pedophile. Just goes to show once again that you can't really trust anybody on this app. On this day two months ago, 19-year-old Sean Paul Velazquez was shot and killed in his girlfriend's bed. I got the privilege of talking to his loved ones, and they want me to share his story. On March 24th at around 12.30 p.m., officers were called to a home in Cold Spring, Texas, and when they arrived, they found Sean lying on the bed in a pool of blood. He'd been shot multiple times and was already deceased. The home belonged to Sean's girlfriend, and when they asked her what happened, she said that her ex-boyfriend, 19-year-old Joshua Escobar, walked into the home and shot Sean. He then fled the scene in a gray car. Joshua was arrested the next day and charged with murder. He was originally being held on a $1 million bond, but the judge recently reduced it to just $75,000. In the weeks leading up to the murder, Sean's girlfriend was reportedly receiving threatening text messages from Joshua, including a threat to kill Sean. Normally when I cover these cases, there's always a ton of information about the bad details or the murder itself, but what I found when researching this case wasn't about that. Instead, I learned how good of a person Sean was and the overwhelming amount of love his friends and families have for him. There's even a whole online tribute wall dedicated just to him. I learned that he had so much charisma and was a true leader. Every post that I read about him said that you could be having the worst day of your life, and if Sean was around, you'd forget it in an instant. He had a big future ahead of him, and it was all cut short over a jealous ex. Since today marks two months without Sean, his family will be holding a vigil for him at the San Jacinto Courthouse tonight at 6 p.m. If you're in the area and it's possible, please stop by and show Sean and his family your support. These adoptive parents have been arrested after locking children in a shed. In West Virginia this week, Donald Lance and Jeannie Whitefeather were arrested. Police were called to a house in Sissonville around 5.45 p.m. on the 2nd of October. This was after a member of the public spotted a man open a shed and speak to two children inside and then lock the door on the way out. Police arrived at the property and forced entry into the shed and found a female and a male. The captive children had no access to running water and no toilet facilities. There was also no food, beds or chairs. The two children told police they had no way to exit the shed and they're believed to be siblings. The children aged 16 and 14 told police this is apparently a common occurrence. They stated that they'd been given food at 6 a.m. that day and then locked up. Disturbingly, there was also another child in the main property. This child was approximately five to six years old. The child was reportedly sitting alone on the floor of the loft crying. 
the child was close to the railing of an approximately 15 foot drop. Police forced entry into the building and rescued the child. Now, when police arrived and while this was all going on, there was no adults at the property. The adoptive parents got home at between 8.30 p.m. and 9.45 p.m. Jeannie told the police when questioned that the children in the shed like it. The two adults pictured here were arrested for gross child neglect, creating a substantial risk of injury. Three weeks ago, this woman showed up at a hospital in Bloomington, Minnesota, saying that she wanted to see her son who had died at the hospital. Esperanza Harding said that her son, Mateo, who was eight months old, had died on March 1st at the hospital, yet there was no record of him being admitted or of him dying there. Staff immediately became suspicious and called the police and when they interviewed her, Esperanza actually admitted that he had died on February 28th and she was the one that had killed him. 20-year-old Esperanza was in a new relationship with this man, 18-year-old Edwin Trudeau, and apparently he didn't like Matteo and he told Esperanza to have him adopted. On the 28th of February, Esperanza was at a Bloomington hotel with Matteo and she'd become annoyed at his crying while she was trying to take a bath. She messaged Edwin saying, I'm about to do something bad. She then grabbed Matteo and held him under the bathwater until he stopped moving. She then took a photo and sent it to Edwin. He apparently rushed around to the hotel and attempted CPR, but it was too late. Esperanza then wrapped Mateo's body in a blanket, stuffed it into a backpack and threw it into a dumpster. Esperanza has been charged with second degree murder and Edwin has been charged with aiding an offender. They are due to appear in court on April 3rd. Mateo's father has paid tribute to him saying that he was always happy and laughing and that his smile lit up a room. Tragically, Mateo's body has not been found. This man has been sentenced to 100 years in prison after doing the unthinkable to his daughter. Tony Valles is a 66-year-old from Helena. On the 10th of July 2022, he was at home with his partner, Heather. Tony's 8-year-old daughter, Ariana, and his 18-year-old son were also at the house at the time. Suddenly, two women entered the property who he believed were evicting him. He flew into a violent rage and grabbed a weapon from his bedroom. At this point, he began shooting. He shot Heather and she fell to the floor and then he shot at his son. His eight-year-old daughter tried to escape and run from the terror, but she was hit with gunfire. She was on the stairs when she was hit by a bullet and she fell back. She tragically died after being rushed to hospital. After his daughter's death, Tony stated, I'm sorry for all this. I can't undo what I've done. The pain and the misery will last a lifetime and I'm sorry for all that. Tony was sentenced to serve 100 years in prison. You can get juice from a potato. Fans of Ariana Grande are absolutely outraged at some of the footage that's recently resurfaced on social media, showing some of her behind the scenes and web only videos that were shot for Nickelodeon. This content is the brain. A lot of this footage is the brainchild of Nickelodeon showrunner Dan Schneider. I've talked about Dan extensively here on my TikTok before, but this guy is the epitome of creep. There are videos of him in hot tubs with some of his young actresses. He was always putting adult humor in kids shows. And he made some of his young actors do some extremely creepy and definitely not okay things. I'm going to show you another clip at the end of this TikTok that Ariana Grande had to do. And it really has me curious. What is the extent of creepy behavior that Ariana Grande experienced while working for Nickelodeon? I mean, so many of her co-stars and people that were on the same network have come forward recently claiming they were not only abused, but they were abused repeatedly. And the footage that Dan Schneider had Ariana star in is creepy to say the least. I don't know if somebody with such a high profile like Ariana would ever come forward and actually expose what had happened to them. But my heart breaks just imagining what possibly could have happened to her while she worked for Dan Schneider. I'm going to play you another clip now and you decide for yourself, is this creepy or not? Because according to a recent press release from Dan Schneider, he believes that all of the content that he filmed for Nickelodeon is completely family friendly. I'm soaking wet! Quick, somebody bring me the- 
mystery surrounds this new incredibly disturbing true crime case. On the 25th of September, housekeeping staff at the Marriott Hotel in Philadelphia Airport made a horrific discovery. An American Airlines flight attendant had been found dead in the room. All we know at this stage is the woman is 66 years old and her name is Diana Ramos. Mysteriously, she was found deceased with a sock in her mouth at 10.45 p.m. on the day in question. The hotel directly connects to the Philadelphia International Airport and the victim had been due to check out two days prior. It's believed that there was no signs of forced entry or a struggle. Investigators are obviously treating this death as suspicious. The actual cause of death has not yet been released. Investigators have told the press that they found sealed bottles of prescription medication in the woman's room. One flight attendant stated, everybody is still trying to figure out what happened and why her crew just left her. It's believed that her crew was LA based. Obviously in this case, there remains an awful lot of unanswered questions. This is a game show that aired in Peru, right? And it's called The Value of Truth. And the concept of the show was pretty simple to follow. Contestants would be asked a series of questions while being connected to a polygraph test. The more questions that they answer truthfully, they got money. And there's a twist to it too. The contestants will have to be next to loved ones to questions. And they will probably ask questions about around the loved ones, bro. And then in 2012, when the first episode aired, a 19-year-old girl who starred in it, and her name was Ruth Talia Sayas. She's with her mom, dad, and her boyfriend. The first couple questions, they're pretty easy to answer. She answers them truthfully. <laughs> and then as the episode keeps going, they get even worse. Like they ask her. First, like question that did all break. See. Trabajas en un nightclub. Sí. Has aceptado dinero a cambio de tener relaciones sexuales. They ask her another question and she refuses to answer. She basically ends the game there. And then after the show aired, it was a big hit, got high ratings and stuff. Ruth, she became like a low-key, like a little celebrity in, in Peru and stuff like that. She was on many interviews on the news, interviewed by other television programs and stuff. And then out of nowhere, she just disappears, bro. 10 days of her friends and family are out looking for her. And then they eventually find her body in the vacant lot, buried and stuff. The main suspect the boyfriend. was the boyfriend and only cause she was on Man is charged with murder after joking that his ex would end up like Gabby Petito. 26-year-old Madeline Kingsbury from Minnesota was found dead in June. She was a mother of two and dropped her children off at daycare on March the 31st, shortly before going missing under suspicious circumstances. She was tragically discovered dead on June the 7th in a wooded area in Fillmore County. At the time she went missing, her ex-boyfriend, 29-year-old Adam Fravel, denied any involvement. He stated, I want the mother of my five-year-old and two-year-old to be found and brought home safely. I want that more than anything. However, behind the scenes, things had not been as they seemed. The pair were newly separated and were in the process of moving out of their home together. They had apparently had an on-off relationship. Madeline's body was discovered near a rural property owned by Adam's parents. She was wrapped in a grey fitted sheet which had apparently come from the home that they shared together. He was arrested the same day that Madeline's remains were found. When being arrested by police, Adam unnervingly mentioned Gabby Petito multiple times. Police state that he admitted to being infatuated with the Gabby Petito case. He also admitted that he made a statement to Madeline about her ending up like Gabby. For those that don't know the Gabby Petito case, she was a 22-year-old girl who was strangled to death by her fiancé back in 2021. Police state that Adam claimed he was trying to make a joke. Texts were also found between the pair in 2021, and in one text, Madeline references a physical altercation they had. She wrote, You know I'm not really okay with or over the fact that you put your hand around my neck and pushed me down in front of the kids earlier. Adam is charged with her murder and could face life in prison. Minutes after this photo was taken, this woman's husband did the unthinkable. Butterfly Valley in Mugla, Turkey is an incredible popular beauty spot. In June 2018, Hakan Hassal was visiting this spot with his wife, 32-year-old Semra, who are both pictured here. The pair was expecting a child soon as Semra was seven months pregnant. The cliff is about 1,000 feet up and many tourists are drawn there by the beautiful views. But little did Semra know she had been lured there for an entirely different reason. 
Semra was actually afraid of heights, but Hakan convinced her that the trip to the cliff would pay off. Prior to the pair going on this trip, Hakan had actually taken out life insurance for his wife. On the day in question, he lured her to the edge of the cliff to take a selfie. The couple had been up there for about three hours and Hakan had been waiting for the exact time to strike. After taking the photo and realizing nobody was watching, he cautiously shoved his pregnant wife off the edge of the cliff, causing her to plummet to her death as well as her unborn child. A witness who was driving by was flagged down by Hakan, who was described as completely calm. The man later stated that I was driving there and I saw someone waving at me and I stopped. Hakan then came over and said that his wife had fallen down the cliff. They then tried to get to the edge of the cliff for a better look, but Hakan did not go down there with them and he was not acting like a man who just lost his wife from falling down a cliff. Photos of the couple were then shared on the news and a tourist came forward to say that they had actually seen the pair too. And they noted that it was odd that the pair was scrambling down the rocky area to get to the very edge. Suspicions then were raised further when Hakan tried to claim an insurance payout after his wife's death. Hakan tried to claim insanity but he was ordered to serve at least 30 years behind bars. But in my opinion, 30 years for killing two people is definitely not enough time. So after knowing the story behind this photo, tell me how disturbing it really is now. Man with no arms was charged with stabbing a tourist using scissors with his feet. John Crenshaw was a well-known figure in South Beach, Florida. With no arms, he would impressively paint pictures with his feet and was once a viral sensation. He was known to be homeless and bragged about impregnating many women, including, he states, Gwen Stefani. In 2018, he was arrested for a shocking incident in Miami Beach. A tourist from Chicago, 22-year-old Cesar Coronado, claimed to have asked John for directions. John claimed that Cesar had punched him in the head. John jumped up, stabbing Cesar with scissors using his feet. Police discovered Caesar bleeding from his arms and he was rushed to hospital. John actually fled the area but was found shortly after close by. He was charged with aggravated battery and had a history of criminal offences. These included disorderly intoxication, vandalism and battery on police officers. I came to Chicago with $40 in my pocket. We had to make a living. I was younger than I am now and thought I needed more. Prohibition was an unjust law. So you tell me right now, I gotta be alone on this floor with an angry loan shark man and the ghost of Al Capone could be in the hallway right now? Exactly. What? Isn't that f***ing weird? Oh! 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 Oh my god, bro. Oh my f***ing god, dude. Oh! 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 So you killed people? Whole families walking to the location of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And it's right here where a hail of gunfire is unleashed on John Dillinger, killing him. And he died right here on this pavement area. Tell me this isn't f***ing scary, bro. I'm straight up the only person in this entire hotel. Yo, what the f***? Oh, dude! Room 666. It doesn't exist. Oh, I got the chills right now. Bro, the one closest to the fucking water. It's like he just walked out of the water and is standing right here. This is the worst cartel execution video that nobody talks about explained. The video that I'm about to explain might be one of the hardest watches and I don't recommend searching for it. The video is about two and a half minutes long and it's shot in the middle of the night. You see a naked man lying on the ground with his hands tied behind his back and he also has a chain around his neck. The victim is surrounded by two cartel members and the torture and the execution begins immediately. One of the cartel members is holding the victim's right leg to keep him still and the other cartel member who is holding the knife takes the victim's left leg and begins cutting it at the knee. The victim screams in unimaginable pain and in a matter of seconds the victim's left leg at the knee is dismembered. And it's obvious the man doing the dismemberment has done this before. He then takes the severed leg and begins beating the victim with it. He hits him over and over again with his own leg until he moves on to the right leg, where he does the same exact process. He then cuts off the victim's right leg at the knee and begins beating him with it. And the victim during this whole process is completely conscious and aware of everything. 
The cartel members then take a moment to pose with the victim's severed limbs, and they then rest them on his torso. The cartel members then turn the victim over so he's lying on his stomach, and they then begin to dismember his arms. They start with his left arm at the shoulder, and at this point the victim begins screaming again, confirming that he is indeed still conscious. They then move on to the victim's right arm, and at this point the victim stops screaming and begins to groan. Almost like he doesn't have the energy to scream anymore, and at this point the video concludes. This video is absolutely horrible and many people tend to skip over and forget about this one. It's absolutely barbaric and it's a sight you will never forget. Whatever you do, please stay curious and never go searching for this video because it will most likely mess you up. I will never get over the fact that stuff like this happens every single day on this planet. This true crime case is extremely distressing, so please be warned before watching. Devin Michaels, a 45-year-old woman from Nevada, has been charged with murder. This came a week after 47-year-old Jonathan Willett was found deceased in a home without his head. It was actually Jonathan's mother who had discovered him lying on a bed next to bottles of ammonia and bleach. His mum also discovered that a meat cleaver from the house was missing. Distressingly, Jonathan was actually the father of Devin's children. He owned a moving company in Las Vegas and was known to locals as the Vegas moving guy. Devin states that the day in question, Jonathan had been abusive to her. He had allegedly tried to SA her and she hit him with a stick. She insists that she didn't intend to kill him but to injure him and get him out of the way. She reports that she wanted to get rid of him for a while while she figured out what to do with the children. She said she had hoped that he was just injured enough to go to the hospital. Jonathan's actual cause of death is still currently unknown, but it is alleged that Devin threw Jonathan's head in the rubbish and this was likely taken away by the bin men. These are pictures with the most horrifying backstories, part one. This is Molly LaRue in Geoff Hood and they are getting their photo taken before hiking the Appalachian Trail. And this was the last photo taken of the couple before they were murdered on Cove Mountain by a wanted drifter named Paul David Cruz. These two just looked so happy and excited to start their journey on this hike, but instead it ended in something they never would have expected in a million years. Next is a picture of Russian freerunner Pavel Kashin doing a backflip off the edge of a 16-story building. Pavel decided to stand on a ledge that was just three feet wide on a rooftop that was 16 floors above the ground. His friends Vladimir and Sasha were filming the stunt. After doing the backflip, Pavel struggled with the landing, losing his footing and falling from the roof to his death on the ground below. This picture is just very disturbing to me because Pavel has no idea that right when he finishes this backflip, he is going to fall 16 stories to his death. Next is a picture of a father posing with his daughter at graduation. However, this father isn't a normal father. This is Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer. And at the time this photo was taken, he had killed 10 people over the span of 25 years. And he only stopped killing to erase his daughter who is pictured here. The BTK killer's story goes very deep and in my opinion, he's definitely one of the most interesting serial killers ever. Next is a photo that all of you may be way too familiar with. This is the last known image of pregnant Shannon Watts. And just a few hours later, she as well as her two daughters who were aged three and four would be dead, murdered by her husband and their father, Chris Watts. Also, he could start a new life with a woman he was cheating on her with. I've made many videos about this case and it's one of those cases that will always stick with you after you're done reading it. Shannon Watts had no idea this would be the last time she would ever walk into her house and see her daughters. May she and those two young girls rest in peace. It's absolutely crazy to think that a woman wanting to adopt a baby would be the one to eventually end his life, but that's exactly what happened in this case. Leyland Corkill was separated from his birth mother at just two days old as she was unable to care for him and at seven months old he was placed with Laura Castle and her husband Scott. Laura actually had mental health problems and she'd admitted to a therapy service that she suffered with low mood, anxiety and anger management problems and she'd even admitted to being aggressive towards her daughter. She also admitted that she was drinking up to a bottle of wine a day, yet during her adoption assessments, none of these problems were raised and she was deemed perfectly suitable to adopt little Leyland, 
yet he was murdered just five months after being placed in her care. Not long after his first birthday, Laura had shaken Leyland so hard and hit his head against the hard surface that he'd suffered a catastrophic brain injury. Laura told paramedics that Leyland had fallen off the sofa and that he'd hit his head, but his injuries were not consistent with her story and she was arrested. He'd been violently shaken and had his head struck with severe force against the hard surface. He had a severe brain injury, internal bleeding, injuries to his eyes, and he was likened to that of a high-speed car crash victim. Neighbours actually said that they heard a thud, and that just shows how hard she must have hit Leyland's head. She was sentenced in May 2022, and she denied murder, but instead pleaded guilty to manslaughter. She said that she'd lost her mind when Leyland wouldn't stop crying, and that she'd shaken him and then accidentally hit his head on the arm of the sofa. Leyland's biological mother said that her son was taken from her because of the risk of emotional and physical harm, yet he actually suffered this at the hands of his adoptive mother. She was told that he would be safe and have a good life and she was fine with that. Now her world is broken. Laura Castle was found guilty of murder and she was sentenced to life with a minimum of 18 years. This is the worst pedophile in Australian history and it was just announced that this guy has over 1,600 charges against him. So for a while in Australia, this guy's identity wasn't being released. That is until just a day or so ago. Well, meet Ashley Paul Griffith. He's 45 years old and he's from Queensland, Australia. So between 2007 and 2022, Ashley abused 91 girls. And it took authorities eight years to track this guy down because he wasn't just abusing these children, he was filming this and posting it on the internet. So Ashley was a childcare worker, which meant he always found himself at daycare centers, which is where he primarily accessed his victims. In one of the more disturbing details from this case, Ashley abused reportedly two different girls at the same daycare center 24 times each. It was also stated that he abused seven different children in one month. So at the time of Ashley's arrest, he was actually working as the director of a childcare center in Brisbane, Australia. I'm going to read you this little excerpt from his staff profile on the Child Care Center's website. He said, I love engaging children in meaningful experiences that inspire their play and learning. Young children are natural inquirers, exploring the world through their senses, seeking answers and building theories. So Ashley wanted the world to see him as this caring adult, when in reality, he was the worst predator in Australian history, at least according to the news and authorities. So like I said, all this was brought about because he was posting all of these abuses on the dark web, selling it to other pedophiles. He was the head of a big network. And in a disturbing twist, his own sister, after his arrest, has been trying to resell the cameras that he used to videotape these abuses. Here's what she wrote on Facebook Marketplace. She said, I'm selling on behalf of my brother who's been recently incapacitated and is unable to do it on his own. I may not be able to answer too many questions, sorry. I feel like these cameras should not only be in the possession of authorities, but they should also be destroyed. No one should ever be using these cameras again. So yeah, I'm excited to see this guy go away for life. Truly one of the sickest people I've ever read about. And it's just, it's shocking to see people like this guy who like to act like they're caring towards children. They take these positions where they're working closely with children and they use that to get access to kids. I mean, it's just despicable. You never really know who you're trusting your kids with when you're bringing them to a daycare center. Yeah, so I'm seeing more and more of these cases recently where children are killing their parents and even their siblings. And I'm not gonna lie, it's scary as hell. In this particular case, it seems that video games may have played a small part, but that can't be all of it. There must have been something else going on. This case is still being investigated, but basically a nine-year-old boy is accused of shooting and killing his father in Tuella, Utah. On February 16th this year, around 7.30pm, police were called to a house with reports of a man with a gunshot wound to the head. It was at first thought that it was a suicide. He was taken to the hospital where he died the next day but it turns out that this wasn't a suicide. The gunshot wound was to the back of his head and he'd also been slashed multiple times around the face, head, arms and hands with a tomahawk style hatchet. There was a bullet hole in the curtain. The hatchet was in the bedroom along with various amounts of ammunition and firearm related items. In the home that night were the victim, his nine-year-old son, two other adults and four other children. 
The victim and his son shared a bedroom and they'd gone to bed early that night following some behavioural issues. They weren't heard from for the whole evening and then the nine-year-old emerged later that night from the bedroom saying that his dad was bleeding from the head and that he was dead. Police seized the boy's tablet along with his dad's phone that he had full access to. The other adults in the house said that this nine-year-old boy would spend hours and hours in his bedroom watching violent videos and playing violent video games. He'd even been disciplined multiple times for showing these gruesome videos to the younger children in the house. He had apparently been playing a violent video game minutes prior to the shooting. One game in particular that he liked to play was Modern Warfare Warzone, which incorporated the same weapons as he'd used in the attack. A 9mm Glock style handgun and a tomahawk hatchet. I personally don't believe that the video games played the whole part in this story. I don't think a nine-year-old boy would just grab a gun and a hatchet and attack their father for no good reason. The investigation is still ongoing, obviously, and the defendant can't be named due to his young age. This woman admitted to committing attempted murder to someone she didn't realise was a police officer. Peggy Valentine is a 44-year-old woman from Louisiana. On May the 4th, 2022, she entered the home of her fiancé's girlfriend's mum. She forced entry into the home armed with a box cutter in the early hours of the morning. It was then that she attacked the mother in her sleep. It's reported that Peggy's fiancé had been seeing another woman who recently had given birth to his child. Peggy reportedly stated that she went to the house simply to try and catch her fiancé in the lie and things escalated. After the attack, she was feeling obviously very guilty and went to her pastor to confess. He advised that she handed herself in. She hadn't actually realised that he was also a major with the parish sheriff's office. She claimed that she went into the house without the intention to hurt anybody but the situation got out of hand. Peggy's attorney argued that the conversation between the pastor and Peggy shouldn't have been admissible in court. However, the judge disagreed. Peggy is due to be sentenced in February next year. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. I have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child murderer and cannibal. Imagine coming home one night to find scattered human body parts on your bathroom floor. Justin Barnett was only 23 years old when he vanished in 1995. It was June the 3rd and he was living in Birmingham, Alabama with his ex-girlfriend Sheila Horton. Now Justin had plans to go to a party that night and was due to meet a new girl there. That evening he borrowed his ex Sheila's car and went out to meet some friends for a drink beforehand. After enjoying the drinks, he told his friends that he was off to meet a girl and that he would be back at some point later. However, he never returned. His friends tried to get in contact with him and see where he was, but they couldn't reach him, so they just presumed maybe he's gone home to sleep. When Justin's ex, Sheila, got back to the house as well, at 2am, she noticed he wasn't home. She was a little bit concerned, but figured maybe he would be back in the morning. The day after, when he failed to come back home, he was reported missing to police. It would be days later that a worrying discovery was made. Sheila's car was found in Lakeview with no sign of Justin. However, this was particularly suspicious because police had actually searched the area where they did find the car previously and the car hadn't been there. It was an agonizing two decades before any news. It was actually January 2015 and a man with a guilty conscience showed up to a police station to make a statement. He was called Jonathan Abney and he was only 18 years old at the time of Justin's disappearance. He had some news that would stun investigators. He'd been living with his older sister Trisha and her boyfriend Jeff Martin at the time of Justin's vanishing. On the night of the 3rd of June 1995, he came home to a scene like that out of a horror film. Dismembered body parts lay all over the bathroom floor and the limbs belonged to Justin. Jonathan had actually met Justin just once previously when he was buying substances. Jonathan told officers that his sister had convinced him to go out that night so she and Justin could have some alone time. However, she had very sinister plans for the evening. Her and her partner planned to rob Justin, but this would go horribly wrong. They ended up stabbing Justin to death and Jonathan had helped the pair get rid of Justin's body. Jonathan then took Sheila's car to the place where police had found it. 
Now, Trisha was arrested and Jeff actually ended his own life shortly after. Trisha was given life in prison without parole and Jonathan was actually given immunity for his confession and cooperation. This young girl was stuck to the bottom of a hot tub and died in one of the worst ways imaginable. This was seven-year-old Virginia Baker and she lived with her family in Virginia and she was one of five children. She started learning how to swim when she was three years old and by the time she was seven, she was considered a very proficient swimmer. On June 15th, 2002, her mother took her and the kids to a friend's house for a little pool party. The friend's house they were going to had a very big pool and a spa that was attached to the pool. Virginia put on her bathing suit and went out with her siblings out to the swimming pool area while her mother was inside the house, but there was other people outside as well. And when her mom went into the backyard to check up on the kids, she couldn't find Virginia in the pool or the spa. That's when her siblings ran up to their mom and said she's in the spa right now and she needs help. At the time, the water in the spa was super bubbly and it was really hard to see through the water. If you've ever been in a hot tub, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But Virginia was stuck to the bottom of the spa, specifically she was suctioned down by the drain of the spa. Her mom then jumps in and she's trying desperately to pull out her daughter. Her mom even said at one point, I thought someone was trying to kill my daughter. She thought that somebody tied her down to the bottom or was weighing her down. Because she honestly couldn't pull her daughter out. So two other men then came in and were just yanking on her. Just desperately trying to pull her away from this drain but it was not working. Later on, they would find out that the suction was roughly 700 pounds worth of suction. Eventually, after several minutes of trying to get her free, they finally managed to pull her from the drain, which caused the drain itself just to completely fracture and break. But by the time they got her out of the spa and by the time the ambulance got there, it was too late. Sadly, Virginia was dead from drowning. For five, six, seven minutes, this young girl was desperately trying to get herself free trying to survive, but she had no chance. The 700 pound suction was way too strong for her. Virginia's death was not the first. This is something that had happened just over the country many, many times. But there was nothing ever done about it. There was never proper drain covers. But it took Virginia's death for something to happen. Her parents fought like hell and her parents got the Virginia Baker Pool and Spa Safety Act to pass, making it law to have the correct covers. Rest in peace to Virginia Baker, this is just so sad and it should have never happened. This former YouTuber was arrested after committing the most unspeakable crimes against his own child. And he was later found hanging in his prison cell. I want to give you a trigger warning before I talk about this because this case is disturbing. This is Carl Harold. He was born in the early 1980s and he was a computer whiz. So Carl uploaded his first YouTube video in July of 2012. In these videos, he was instructing people on how to program computers, and shockingly, his channel is still up on YouTube to this day. As you can see here, he had around 30,000 subscribers before he was arrested, and due to fascination about this guy after the crime, I think that's why some of his videos have substantial amounts of views. So Carl seemed like a very harmless guy. He had a nine-year-old son, he was living his best life. That is, until December of 2013, when Carl was arrested with another man named Charles Dunavant. Carl and Charles were domestic and romantic partners, and they were arrested for disturbing crimes. So these two sickos who lived with each other in Alabama actually held Carl's son hostage for eight months straight. Keep in mind, Carl had a nine-year-old son. And what these two men did to the boy was unspeakable. They were charged with crimes like sexual torture, exposing a minor to an STD, sodomy, and yes, in a dark twist, the production of CP. So Carl and Charles were part of a larger CP network that existed on the dark web. And like I said, for eight months, they'd been holding Carl's son hostage, abusing him in horrific ways, taking photos and videos of all of this and uploading it to this ring on the internet. In a news article that I read about this case, the Alabama police officers actually couldn't report on what they had found in the house, like the photos and videos, because they claimed it was so horrific they couldn't bear to look at the content. So that just goes to show how truly twisted these two people were. Now, they were going to be co-defendants and tried together, but about exactly a year to the day after Carl Harold was arrested, he was found hanged in his jail cell. He had taken his own life before he had to face the repercussions for these terrible acts. Eventually, though, Charles Dunavant was sentenced to 36 years in prison. And while I don't think that that's nearly long enough, at least he didn't take the easy way out like Carl. 
and I hope that his life in prison is absolutely as horrific as it could possibly be. It is eerie though, thinking that YouTube has kept Carl's channel online. And I think it's definitely one of the channels that YouTube should look at terminating. This is the gruesome case of Linda Spence Explained. Linda Spence was working as a financial advisor in Scotland and was reportedly involved in some shady dealings, accepting multiple deposits from elderly people for flats which were never built. In 2010, 27-year-old Linda Spence began to negotiate a deal for what she claimed was a valuable parcel of land near Stansted Airport and as part of this deal she produced some handmade bond certificates she claimed were issued by the government of Denmark. She attracted an investment of £80,000 from Colin Coates, a man with something of a reputation for being involved in criminal enterprise. While looking for further investors for her project, she traveled to the United States where the fraudulent bonds caught the attention of the FBI and she quickly left the country. Linda's house of cards was beginning to crumble around her when she returned to Scotland, and she ignored repeated attempts at contact from Mr. Coates, who was beginning to be concerned about his investment. Coates then took matters into his own hands by snatching Linda from the streets of Glasgow in April 2011. Coates hired two associates to watch Linda while she was held captive. Linda's disappearance was investigated by police who quickly identified Coates as a person of interest based off their financial dealings. However, Coates denied any involvement in her disappearance and the investigation appeared to stall. At this point, Linda's family has become aware of her sketchy dealings and maintained hope she had simply just fled the country. However, Coates was eventually betrayed by a witness who became concerned for his life due to his knowledge of the crime and Coates' constant threats to silence him. He then went to the police naming Coates as her kidnapper and gave the names of the associates who had guarded Linda during her ordeal. Upon being arrested, the two associates agreed to give evidence against Coates in return for reduced sentences. They reported that Linda was kept alive for over two weeks, during which time she was humiliated and tortured by Coates. She was tied to a chair and forced to sit in her own waist, had her thumb cut off, her kneecap shattered with golf clubs, her feet completely crushed and her hands completely burnt with an iron. Coates' associates both claimed they did not witness Linda's eventual murder, but believed that Colin Coates decapitated her and put her body in the boot of his car. In the days after Linda was believed to have been killed, Coates asked a friend to borrow his boat, but was turned down. Colin Coates was found guilty of Linda Spence's murder, but has also denied any involvement. Linda's body has still never been found despite ongoing extensive searches by the police of Scotland. And they say this case will not be closed until Linda is found. This case is absolutely sickening, but Linda Spence did steal $80,000 from a man who was known to be involved in criminal activity. Not saying she deserved what happened to her at all, I'm just saying she messed with the wrong person and got the full consequence of it. Rest in peace to Linda Spence, and I hope her body is found soon. Sometimes true for strange fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism. The death of Heath Ledger was one of the most tragic things to ever happen to Hollywood. So if you don't know who Heath Ledger was, he was a very famous actor that hailed from Australia. And I would argue that his most famous role that he ever played was the Joker in 2008's The Dark Knight. So Heath Ledger was in a number of huge movies, including 10 Things I Hate About You, Lords of Dogtown, Brokeback Mountain, and yes, The Dark Knight. So at the time of his death, Heath was one of the biggest rising stars in all of Hollywood. He had told his friends that he aspired to direct films himself when he was older, and he had been attached to a number of big projects before his passing. So, after Heath accepted the role as the Joker in The Dark Knight, he started to change. He had told the press before that when he took on some of these bigger roles, he couldn't sleep. But he stated that after taking on the role of the Joker, his insomnia was incredibly harsh. These problems with insomnia had led Heath to actually sleep only around two hours a night while he was filming the movie. This led him to take Ambien pills, but those pills didn't work. In the time leading up to his death, Heath actually thought that he was suffering from some sort of respiratory infection. He was having difficulty sleeping and breathing. He felt like this was related to filming in some of the damp conditions that he was in. And he was telling all of his friends and co-workers that he just couldn't sleep and that's why he was taking so many different pills. It was widely reported before his death that Heath Ledger struggled with substance abuse. 
but this would all come to a head on January 22nd, 2008. On that day, Heath Ledger's housekeeper and massage therapist actually found his unconscious body in his loft. It was around 3 p.m. in New York City, and shortly after he was discovered, EMTs and medical personnel arrived at his apartment, but unfortunately, he was already dead. After the autopsy was performed and a toxicology report was taken, it was revealed that Heath Ledger died from an overdose from a number of different drugs. When he died, oxycodone, hydrocodone, diazepam, temazepam, alprazolam, and other drugs were found in his system. He had taken Xanax, Hydros, Oxys, all sorts of drugs, and this had obviously led to his death. Heath's death was so shocking and so sudden that it created international headlines. And authorities even opened investigations into his doctors. But no charges were ever brought against anybody. And to this day, it's still unknown how Heath actually got access to the Oxys and the Hydros that he had taken on the day of his death. So Heath actually died before The Dark Knight was ever released theatrically. And upon the film's release, it became a box office smash. It broke a ton of world records. And he was awarded a posthumous Academy Award. Yes, he won Best Supporting Actor at the Academy Awards in 2009, even though at the time he had already passed away. I remember when this happened, I loved The Dark Knight when I was younger. This was so sad to find out, and obviously rest in peace to Heath Ledger, he's definitely missed. This is the Hogtie video, a disturbing new cartel video you should never go looking for explained. This video is extremely graphic and I don't recommend looking for it at all. The video is around 3 minutes in length and it was released in February 2024 and it comes from the country Myanmar. Some people are saying the victims involved in this video may have been local thieves, though there is no concrete evidence of this. And even if they were, a punishment this brutal followed by death really doesn't fit the crime. The perpetrators behind the incident are alleged members of the military. And this video gives off the sense that it's a mob justice incident as in the background you can see multiple villagers looking on without expressing any real emotion at all. In fact, they are enjoying and cheering on the ordeal. The video involves a form of torture and death that is extremely brutal and will shock you to the core. Essentially, both victims are slow cooked to death and as you play the video, you are met with complete brutality right away. You see two men who are hogtied and they are hanging from a tree by a chain. The chains making sure the victims are held securely over the intense heat of the fire below them. Beneath the victims is a pile of wood that has been ignited and the victims dangle from the chains in a hogtied position right above the fire. But in a way that only the tips of the flames are touching the victims. They are not completely engulfed in flames by design basically to prolong the victim's suffering. One of the victims is actually closer to the flames than the other and is hung higher up. As you play the video, you are shown a still image of the victims that shows the victims tied up and badly beaten. You are then met with the visual of both men hanging above the fire and the cameraman is filming close enough, ensuring you see the men's facial reactions as they burn alive. The men grimace and cough up clumps of spit and mucus as the smoke and hot air fill their lungs. As mentioned before, one of the victims is closer to the fire and the flames are essentially engulfing his entire chest. The men don't scream, but you hear them let out continuous groans that are extremely disturbing. Men who appear to be wearing military outfits then throw dry grass and small sticks on the fire causing the flames to climb higher towards the victims. And as this happens, both the crowd of people watching and the military men begin to cheer. As the fire burns, you see chunks of the victim's clothes fall off as they burn. At this point, the flames have engulfed the victim who is hanging higher. His chest and face are in the flames. He tries his best to distance himself from the fire, but he can't due to the hog tie. He just continues to hang in the fire as it burns away his clothes. You then begin to see both victims' skin blister and tear due to the intense heat. The man hanging lower to the fire appears to pass out, however, the second victim remains conscious much longer. All while he is still engulfed in flames, you hear him spit and cough due to the smoke, and the victim keeps trying to move, but after a period of time, his movements begin to get slower and slower. A man then throws a flammable liquid on the fire, which makes the fire blaze way more powerful. After a few seconds, the second victim appears to pass out or die. His body begins to seize and almost contract. The crowd and military continue to look on. Some can even be heard laughing as they watch the men burn to death. And this is where the video finally concludes. 
This video is extremely disturbing and hard to explain and watch. You see chunks of flesh melt away as the fire burns through the victim's clothes. The victim's groans and the sounds of them hacking up spit and mucus is very unsettling. I really don't recommend looking up this video because it really is kind of barbaric and very disturbing. They literally hogtied two men and chained them from a tree and then lit a fire beneath them and let them burn to death. This reminds me of some ancient torture methods just based off the pure brutality of it, being the brazen bull that comes to mind first. Trust me, do not watch this video and please stay curious on it, it really is disturbing. This little girl was kidnapped in 2018 and has just been found. On the 25th of October 2018, four-year-old Aranza Lopez was on a supervised visit with her biological mum. Her mum, Esmeralda, was being investigated over abuse allegations, so Aranza was actually in foster care at the time. It was arranged that the pair would have a supervised visit at a Washington shopping centre. However, during the visit, Esmeralda requested to take Aranza to the toilets and used the opportunity to snatch the little girl in a stolen vehicle. The FBI were notified and a huge search for Aranza and even advertised a $10,000 reward. It wasn't until a year later that Esmeralda was found and arrested, but there was still no sign of the little girl. That was until last month. She was recovered by Mexican authorities in February in Western Mexico. In 2021, Esmeralda was actually extradited back to Washington state and pled guilty to second degree kidnapping and robbery. She was sentenced to 20 months in prison. I'm gonna warn everybody right now, the case that we're about to cover is easily one of the most disturbing true crime stories I've ever heard in my life. So viewer discretion is really advised for this one. This is Kevin Davis. He was 18 years old back in 2014 when this horrific event took place. Kevin lived here in Corpus Christi, Texas and shared an apartment with his mother, Kimberly, and his sister, Destiny. On May 26, 2014, Kevin snapped. He had been having homicidal thoughts for a long time, but on that particular day, he decided to bring his dreams and his fantasies into reality. On that morning, Kevin told his mother, Kimberly, that he wanted to unalive himself, and she told him that she couldn't stop him if he wanted to. After hearing this unexpected response from his mother, Kevin went into a rage. He grabbed a cord and attempted to strangle his mother on the couch where she was sitting. But his mom, Kimberly, managed to fight him off, and in a panic, Kevin went into the other room and grabbed a hammer. Now, this is where it gets really disturbing, so if you're still here with me and you have a weak stomach, don't keep listening. Kevin then bashed his own mother's skull in with the hammer, hitting her at least 20 times. And he then grabbed a knife from the kitchen and inserted the knife into the head wound. At that point, Kimberly's head was opened up. She had a massive head wound and her brain was exposed. And Kevin stuck his hand into his own mother's head and played with her brains. He later told detectives that it felt like putty. Now, after his mother was dead, Kevin dragged her corpse into another room and her which is unbelievably shocking and disgusting. After all this was said and done, he went to a neighbor's house, told them to call 911, told them that he had just murdered someone, and he was arrested without incident. When Kevin ultimately arrived at the police station, he was brutally honest with investigators about his crimes. I listened to the entire interrogation and I cannot unhear some of the things that he told investigators. It's vile and shocking. But at one point, he smiles at the investigators with a little grin and says, yes, I guess I lost my, to a corpse. After his trial, he was handed down a sentence of life in prison. He's still alive, he's still in Texas right now, and he even admitted to investigators that if he was given the chance, if he were out on the street again, he would kill again. I'm sorry to have to fill your guys' minds with this stuff, but this is a truly disturbing case that I can't stop thinking about because of how horrific it is. And, uh, and yeah, I cannot believe that this happened. You will not believe this insane plot twist. In 2008, Carolyn Watson and Julian Butchwald were a young religious couple. They were living in Melbourne, Australia and had been together around two years. Julian was driving the pair to a picnic date in the car, but he actually stopped the car suddenly, noticing an animal on the side of the road. Suddenly, something horrific happened. Carolyn's vision went completely black after being blindfolded by a terrifying masked man. All she could work out was she was being stripped off and thrown into a vehicle. The car finally stopped and she took her blindfold off 
and she was really relieved to see that her boyfriend was by her side. He'd also been stripped off and the couple were completely in the middle of nowhere. The pair managed to untie themselves, but were having to just wander around aimlessly for a week, trying to find safety. Meanwhile, police were desperately searching for the couple. Family and friends were really concerned and they knew how out of character this was for the pair to go missing. They sent out air and water search teams, but just couldn't locate the couple. As the missing pair were very religious, they'd actually vowed to be celibate until marriage, but Julian started to suggest that it might be a good idea to break this celibacy in order to keep them warm. Finally, a local farmer found the couple and alerted police. However, they quickly found that the story didn't really add up. Julian soon confessed to police that he'd actually made the whole thing up and he'd staged the kidnapping. His motive was purely to try and get his girlfriend to break their vow of celibacy.